Tonight's lecture is called Transactional Analysis, Understanding and Diffusing the Games People Play. And the first thing that I want to start with is um, a disclaimer. I'm not a therapist, and my objective in presenting this information is not to provide therapy or mental health care. I was introduced to transactional analysis when I was a teenager. My mother was a person who studied it, and I found myself going to the strangest meetings you've ever been to. Furthermore, I ended up getting a therapist because my mother was <laughs> into therapy. So when I got my therapist, uh, actually used transactional analysis as a um, modality. So when I became an instructor for Autodesk and later for UCLA and, um, and a number of, like the Art Institute and a number of other educational institutions, I found out that many of the things that I had learned when I was taking these transactional analysis therapy workshops as a, as a teenager turned out to be really useful in, in creating a really productive and collaborative work environment for myself and my students. And so as an adult, I went back and started doing a lot of research into transactional analysis to figure out wh what was working and why it was working so well. So the information I review in this presentation is kind of a quick primer to the theory and practice of transactional analysis as documented by Eric Byrne in his book, Games People Play. If you find the information interesting, I heartily encourage you to go get the book, Games People Play by Dr. Eric Byrne. And then for further reading, you might want to check out a book by Dr. Thomas Harris called I'm Okay, You're Okay. Now, writers, actors, and screenwriters who go through this presentation may find a lot of ideas that help them create more interesting characters and more interesting human relationships and human dynamics because they're going to be exposed to a number of fairly well-documented games and transactions that people have in the real world. Filmmakers and working entrepreneurs are going to find that some of the information presented here gives them a new way to look at human interaction and a new way to interpret human behavior. And I think having issued that disclaimer, I'll go ahead and dive in and I think you'll see what I mean. So let's just have a two-second introduction to Dr. Eric Byrne. He was a practicing psychiatrist and he created an effective model for human interaction. And based on this model or this, this way of seeing, actually documenting human interaction, he created a series of techniques that have been used worldwide to modify human behavior. Techniques that he documented can be applied very, very quickly because most of the techniques involve changing how you communicate as opposed to what you're trying to accomplish. He also provided a model that allowed people to be autonomous or to be in control of their own behavior even when they were in very dysfunctional relationships, which made it somewhat unique. Usually it used to be the case, or, and to some degree some people think it still is, that the only way to handle a dysfunctional relationship is sort of to abandon the dysfunctional party. And the problem with that is that sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes you're stuck dealing with people that you can't get rid of. Like it's, it's a little bit hard to fire your boss every time the guy acts like a jerk. So the question is, is there a way to, to deal with him that modifies his behavior slightly? And Dr. Eric Byrne came up with a number of techniques that seem to work fairly well for most people, and he documented the cases in which it's unlikely to work well. Now, before you um, apply these methods in your own life, it's important to, especially if you're dealing with somebody, a very difficult situation or a very, uh, the kind of situation where somebody could get hurt, it's very important that you work, actually work with a practicing psychologist or psychiatrist to make sure that the changes that you're making in your life and the changes that you're planning on making in your human relationships within your family and within your workplace are actually going to be adaptive and safe to you. Um, the one thing about any kind of model of, for human interaction or, or understanding any psychological concept or psychological theory is that when you, if you're not careful when you apply the general principles, you can hurt yourself, which is a little bit the same as when people decide that they're going to go read a diet book that tells them that they should only drink um, lemonade seven days a week you know, for two weeks. You know, and they land themselves in the hospital. Like most things that can be efficacious, this, the principles uh, I'm going to discuss can actually create some changes that are pretty traumatic if you're not careful. So let's sort of start with the fundamentals that's, that are documented in um, games people play, and I'm okay you're, okay, you're okay. The first fundamental principle of transactional analysis is that every single one of us is born basically okay. In effect, we're all born as a little prince or a little princess. You know, we are generally, by nature, kind and gentle and smart and reasonable and joyful. 
And we may each have our own little idiosyncrasies and our predilections and our differences. You know, some of us might not like loud noises and some of us like to climb, but generally we're pretty good folk. The next principle is that we all need interaction and um, human attention in order to survive. And without it, we die. And this is a very specific principle that the the book documents. If it, if you have an environment in which a human child receives physical attention and physical care, but they do not receive human interaction, they do, in fact, die. So it is not just enough to have food and shelter. You need other things as well. Every single human does. Now, generally speaking, the way we get human interaction initially is from our parents. And these units of human interaction, Dr. Byrne called strokes. And they're, like when you stroke a cat, a cat walks by and you pet it once, that's a stroke. He said that um, humans, in effect, give one another strokes all day long, little moments, little instants of human interaction. Now, strokes kind of come in two different forms. One might be considered a warm fuzzy. So that's when somebody says something nice to you, like, you know, you did a really great job, or excellent work, or thank you so much for all the hard work that you do every day, or, you know, you really have a lot of insight. People also give cold pricklies, which are, that's not very smart. You're really very stupid. So he said that parents are basically giving out these strokes to their child every single minute when they first come home from the hospital. And over the course of a person's life, they engage with more and more people who give them more and more positive and negative strokes. He mentioned that there are times when people give mixed strokes. For example, a warm prickly. A warm prickly sounds nice, but it's really basically mean. Oh, you're so pretty, you must be really vain. Or a cold fuzzy, which might be you're so smart, you do so good in school, you must be a nerd. Or when people, when we were in school, people would say, oh, you're a brain. On the one hand, they're saying you're smart, but on the other hand, they're saying that, you know, you're not very functional or you're not very attractive or you're some other stereotype. So these kinds of mixed messages the kids get, particularly if they get a lot of them when they're young, are really confusing and often very disabling. In some families, for example, the notion is, well, if you're pretty, you can't be smart. Your mother says to you, well, you know, it's a good thing you've got a good head on your shoulders because, you know, no one's ever going to marry you for your looks. What the hell is that? <laughs> That's a really mean thing to say. And yet, on the one hand, she's telling you you're pretty, and on the other hand, she's telling you that you're stupid, you know, or it could go the other way. It's just, so those kinds of mixed interactions are really disabling. Now, the next thing he talked about is the fact that humans engage every day in really in a pretty much continuous search for stroke. And we engage in all kinds of behavior that's designed to actually do nothing more than create these kinds of interactions. And he kind of defined a few kinds of interactions. One is something called a pastime, which basically it's it's an interaction where there's no winner, there's no loser. People just connect. Sometimes it's as simple as a a greeting when you walk into the office and you say hi to the receptionist and the receptionist says hi back and you say, how, you know, I, are you looking forward to the weekend? And she says, yes. It's a, it's just a little interaction. Sometimes it's a game. And a game a lot of times has a winner and a loser. Sometimes there's multiple. Sometimes there are multiple player games where you have several people playing and there's multiple winners and multiple losers. Ideally, you'd like to have most interactions work out so that everybody gets the sense that they're okay, that nobody feels put down unfairly, nobody feels like they're being abused, Um Everybody walks away with a good feeling. I'm okay. You're okay. And he also said, took it as a general principle that most adults don't need to, that adults really don't have a right to control one another. So it's not, it's really not okay when one adult says to another, you must do this, you must do that, you have to do this. Those kinds of um, interactions where one person's trying to control another, uh, are twisted interactions in the sense that, generally speaking, we don't, you know, slavery is illegal and you're not really allowed to go around controlling one another. So I can tell you what I want. I can tell you what I need. I can say this is what I'd like to have happen, but I can't actually force you to do things because it's, you know, immoral. And also, 
I can't make you do it without starting to use physical or emotional manipulation. So those are some of the fundamental principles that uh, if you read games people play, you'll read about. We talked about strokes. We talked about warm fuzzies and cold pricklies, warm pricklies and cold fuzzies. Raising children to a significant degree is about teaching them how to get strokes. It's about teaching them how to get the kind of interactions that they want. And most people, especially children, think that the stroke economy that they're born into is normal. So if I'm in a household where people are always saying stuff like, well, you're not very bright, but we love you anyway, or you're so smart, but you're a nerd, or any kind of those kinds of interactions, we think when we're little, we just think that's how people treat each other. And we grow up and we try to recreate those that kind of stroke economy in our own household. So these kinds of these kinds of relationships are propagate through a family. They're hereditary. They get passed down from person to person, family to family. And you, so it tends to make it make it so that people recreate if they had a dysfunctional home life, they tend as a child, they tend to end up at least initially trying to recreate exactly that home life because they really don't know how to interact with anybody in another way. So, and a lot of times people don't realize that they're bringing these kind of crazy interactions or stroke economies with them from home to, you know, from their childhood home into their adult home, into their relationship with their children and into their relationships with their boss. So one of the things that transactional analysis seeks to do is help people understand what the stroke economy is and help them figure out how to change it so that they end up with more functional human relationships. Now, we're going to step back and talk about ego states. So every single one of us has within them a natural child. He's honest, he's curious, he likes to play, and this child is actually the source for a lot of our creativity because it really does have very strong feelings and has very strong impressions. Let's say, for example, you go out to a dinner party and somebody is trying to feed you their favorite food and you take a bite and you think, yuck, I hate that. That reaction of, yuck, I hate that, is an honest reaction from the natural child. It's a very straightforward feeling. It's what you actually think. It's what you actually feel. Now, in addition to this natural child, we also have inside of us models or internal voices that we got from our parents when they were sort of telling us what to do. And they, these parental voices say things like, you should do this, you should do that, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. They're, they're very... Um, they're about they're telling you what you should and should not be doing, and sometimes they say it really nicely. Sometimes this internal voice that from our parents that we've inherited uh, says something in a nice way, like they'll say, "You know, honey, um, I know it's difficult, but you know you really should do your homework. If you don't do your homework, you know you're not going to be successful. So it's really important for you to do your homework, right, honey?" And then sometimes it's like, "Do your homework. I've told you fifteen thousand times. I'm never going to do it again." So there's um, a nurturing parent, which says things nicely, and then there's a critical parent that says things meanly. But both these two parents are trying to tell you what to do. And when you are being hard on yourself and you're saying, you know, God, I really screwed that up, you know, and I should never do that, I should never have done that, you know, that is your critical parent talking to you. And sometimes you're, you're, you have the nurturing parent come in and say, you shouldn't have done that. You've made a mistake, but it's going to be okay, and you can do this next time, or here's something you really ought to do. Um, you should. So these two voices, these adults living in our head, they don't just talk to us. They also talk to other people. So your your child comes home from school and hasn't done its homework, and you get an, you get got a nasty email from the teacher, and you look at the kid, and, and you want to tell that child, who's, who may not be a child anymore, what to do. So you may say to them, you know, you really screwed up today and you should just go on and do your homework and I don't know why I have to keep telling you this. That's your critical parent talking to them. Now, the interesting thing is that child that you're speaking to, that young person that you're speaking to, also has in inside him a natural child that plays and laughs and has very strong opinions. And it also has other voices that respond to this kind of what amounts to an attack. Usually, if you attack somebody with a critical parent, they're going to come back with a rebellious child. And the rebellious child says, you can't make me do anything. So almost every single time you use this, the tone of voice that says, 
that uses a critical voice to say, you know, you're a jerk, you should do this, or you should do that, and says it in a critical way, you're going to trigger in the other person a response that comes from a rebellious child saying, you can't make me. If you use a, if you use a nurturing parent voice where you say, honey, you know, you really have to, tr- you know, you, you're a really good kid, but you're really going to have to try harder because it's really important that you do well in school, and I know you can do it the response that you're going to get from the other person is going to still be a child, but it'll be more compliant. Yes, Mommy, I'll try. Now, whether or not he'll actually try, you don't know. But yes, Mommy, I'll try. It's a compliant child. So in a way, you can think about the fact that inside you right now, you've got the na- the natural child who feels and plays and has all kinds of emotions about things. You've got a critical parent and a nurturing parent, and you've also got the rebellious child and the compliant child that you used to use when your parents talked to you in a mean tone of voice. So that's five people living inside you all the time. Well, there's one more voice you need to be aware of, and that's called the adult. The adult is the one that says two plus two is four. Four plus four is eight. If I drop something, it's going to hit the ground. If I throw a hammer, I might hurt somebody. It is literally a human calculator. So inside you, you have the the natural child, the adult, critical parent, nurturing parent, rebellious child, and compliant child. And really, pretty much all human interactions for most people are going to be in one of those voices. You know, either the two parents, the two children, the adult, or the natural child. Now, a moment ago... I talked about an interaction that might happen between two people where one of them speaks to the other and says, you should do this and says it. And then the person that comes back and responds is going to be the other person's child. Right? So if I, if somebody, if I talk to you like a parent, your natural response is to shoot back at me like a a child saying, you can't tell me what to do, or I'm not going to do it right now because you're not the boss of me. So, there's a series of um, diagrams that they use to, to, to create, to show a picture of what that looks like. And what it looks like is um, a snowman with parent at the top, adult, and then child at the bottom. And so if you think about two snowmen facing each other, my parent can talk to your child and your child is going to talk back. So you're going to have, a, that's basically what it looks like is just two snowmen, <laughs> what amounts to two snowmen talking with somebody's parent talking to somebody else's child. Well, the interesting thing is, Eric Burns said, most of the time, in almost every situation, people do better when their adults talk. And the interesting thing about adults talking is that no one can tell the other one what to do. So any words like should and ought really don't have any place in a human interac- in a human adult interaction because I don't have the right to tell you what to do. And any time I try to tell you what to do, I'm going to trigger this response. And the interesting thing is your child response is likely to trigger in me a desire to be even more of a critical parent. So those kinds of parent-to-child interactions just are not functional, whereas an adult-to-adult transaction is usually very functional. So how would that sound? So your kid comes home, you've heard a, and you've got a call from the school today saying that your child hasn't done their homework for three weeks. And let's say the kid's 15 or 16 years old. Eric Byrne would say, you should look at the kid and say, so I got a call from the school today. They indicate that you haven't done your homework, and they say because you haven't done your homework, you might not actually be able to go on to the next grade level. Did you know that? And the the child says, I was aware that I hadn't done my homework. I wasn't aware that I was not going to proceed to the next grade level unless I did my homework. And then the parent in the conversation can actually say, do you need help making it so that you can do your homework? Is there anything I can do to make it easier for you to do your homework? And the person who hasn't done their homework can say, no, I'm just screwing around. That's why I haven't done it. In which case, that person has made the choice that he doesn't want to be successful. And most of the time, in most human interactions, that's his choice to make. We can't force one another to be successful, and we can't force one another to do beyond a certain age, around 12. You can't really your ability to force your child to do something kind of evaporates. At that point, your issue becomes 
asking them, what do you want to accomplish and can I help you get there? Is there anything I can do to make things easier for you? No? Okay, then. Well, good luck because you have to do your homework now. To the extent that you in a workplace or in a creative environment or in a, a any kind of relationship that you want to be productive, any time that you can stay in adult-to-adult interactions, the more successful you're likely to be. And that is 100% true, except that Eric Byrne would also mention that your natural child, your natural child, the part inside of you that has feelings, actually is a very powerful part of your personality. And when people's natural children speak to one another, that can often be a truly wonderful thing. And what does that sound like? Well, it sounds like if you can imagine two kids that are running along, uh, running along the beach, and they stop because they see a shell, and they crouch down and they look at the shell. And one can go, wow, that is a beautiful shell. Look at that. Isn't it pretty? And the other one goes, oh, I can't believe how beautiful it is. It's so wonderful. You And then the other guy goes, do you want to run? Yeah, right? The reason is because the natural children play together. So if you can – so when people are honestly speaking about their emotions and about how they feel about things – they can become happier because nobody's hiding any of their emotions and nobody's trying to control anybody. So, and it, so he would say, you know, the more that you get the adults, the adult to adult interaction, and the more that you get the natural children accurately expressing how they feel, the more likely it is to ha- that you're going to have very effective social interactions. The next principle that's very interesting to think about is that Eric Burns said that you're responsible. You personally are responsible for how you respond. To any human interaction. So if you are a adult and you go home to visit your aged mother and you walk through the door and you're dressed in a way that she finds inappropriate and you walk through the door and she says, oh, you, you should never dress like that. I've told you a hundred times that whenever you dress like that, you look totally fat. Eric Byrne would say that you have a choice about how you respond in that situation. You can choose to react as a rebellious child or you can choose to come back as an adult and say, "Hi mom, I'm really glad to see you." You don't in other words, you don't have to you don't ever have to take the bait when somebody starts an interaction that you don't like the sound of. So if I am a 16-year-old and I know about transactional analysis and I come home and my rage-filled father starts screaming at me because I haven't done my homework, I can listen. And when he's done, I can say, "I'll look into the homework situation." Or I can choose to say nothing if it, if that's if it's a better way for me to end the to to ensure that there's the transaction's not going to continue, but I never ever have to come back in, as a rebellious child. I never have to continue the negative interaction. The reason that this is important is it actually puts you 100% in control of most human interactions that you're involved in because you can listen to the di- you can listen to the dialogue you can recognize that somebody's talking to you as a critical parent and you can actually say I'm not going to respond or when I do if I do respond I'm going to come back as an adult or I'm going to come back as a natural child so I can with your debt when debt your father is shouting at you about not doing your homework you can come back and you can say I'll I'll handle my homework or I can take care of my homework it'll be okay or you don't have to worry about my homework. It's my responsibility. So you can come back with any kind of response that you want. Or you can come back as a natural child and say, when you shout at me, I feel bad. Notice that you're not saying, when you shout at me, you make me feel bad. Because in transactional analysis, nobody makes anybody feel anyway. When you shout at me, I feel bad is saying, when you when I have this stimulus, I have this response. It's what the natural child is sa- saying. It's like if the natural child said, I don't like being shouted at. It's just a statement of fact, and it's how I feel. I don't like being shouted at. And it doesn't mean the other guy has to do anything. It just means you're just telling him exactly how you feel. So it's a very powerful thing. One of the most powerful principles in transactional analysis is the idea that nobody you're, nobody is responsible for how anybody else feels, and nobody is responsible. Nobody, you're, you are responsible for what you choose to respond to. Now, we're going to talk about something interesting that happens. So it turns out that most human interactions are based upon people giving each other sort of the same amount of attention. So if we have, if if two people are are in a conversation, usually the number of lines each person says, so the the compliments that go back and forth are even. So for example, let's say we've got Ted 
and Jenny. Ted's walking through the front door of the office, and Jenny sits at, sits at the receptionist desk. So Ted says, hi, Jen. And Jenny says, hey, Ted. And Ted says, how are you doing? Jenny says, great. Are you? Ted, very well. Thanks. Jenny, see you around. Ted, see you. And then Ted goes back in, into the office where he's working. Well, in that interaction we just talked about, both of them had four lines. They both equally responded to one another. Ted had four lines. Jen had four lines. In effect, they each traded an equal number of strokes. Now, what's interesting is what happens if you have a dialogue where people don't share the same, don't give each other the same number of strokes. So let's hear what that sounds like. So Ted walks to the front door and he says, hi, Jen. And Jenny says, hey, Ted. Ted says, how are you doing? Jenny just keeps working. Ted says, pretty good? Jenny doesn't say anything or she nods. Ted says, um, okay, well, later. In that interaction, Ted, Jen got four strokes because Ted basically talked to her four times trying to elicit reactions. But he only got one stroke back. She said, he, she said hi, Jen, and, and Jenny said, hey, Ted, back. So can you see in those kinds of unequal stroke economies, what ends up happening is one person ends up feeling uneven. And I think you've probably had these kinds of interactions with a lot of people. This is... In fact, this is one of the ways in which people who are not rational tend to make people feel rather unsettled and it's or uncomfortable because people aren't providing each other with the same number of strokes or the same kind of responses. And so people start to feel bad because they don't know what's wrong. So generally, the reason that this is important is when you're trying to create a, um, um, a happy home or a happy work environment, it's important to be conscious of when people are asking for strokes by engaging in an interaction. And if it turns out, like let's, if you were Jen, you know, and you're sitting at the front desk and you can never get any work done because 50,000 people always say hi to you every day, you can actually take Ted aside and you can go, you know, Ted, I really like you. And I really love it when you say hi to me in the morning. And I love saying hi back. But I never, like after that, I have to work. And if if you keep talking to me, what ends up happening is I just can't get any work done. Because, people, you know, you can see how I would just be saying hi all day long. And these interactions, like, if they just fill up my whole day. It gets really to be really stressful. If Jen does that, she explains to Ted the situations in such a fashion that Ted knows what's happening. So when he comes in, he'll just say, hi, Jen. And Jenny will say, hi, Ted. And then both of them will have given each other one stroke each, and everybody will be happy. So being conscious of the sort of stroke economy running in your office and and working directly with communicating directly and clearly and honestly with somebody who is kind of giving out too requesting too many strokes or requesting too much interaction can really make things much 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 easier and um now another sort of interesting byproduct of this sort of stroke economy conversation is that oddly enough a lot of human intera interaction is actually literally nothing more than this kind of crazy stroke trading. It really is not. You'd be shocked at how much of people's life is about these kinds of things. And, you know, very pleasurable moments, actually. So now we're going to sort of start moving into games and other kind of formulaic interactions. So it's, we're going to talk about something called a pastime. And these are just ways to trade stroke socially. And that one of the pastimes that they talk, that Eric Byrne talks about in his book is called Martini. And Martini is basically where people sit around and say, talk about drinks they've tried. <laughs> so want somebody to go, have you tried an apple teeny? <gasps> yes, I have totally tried an apple teeny, and I truly love it. But you know what I would really like much better? A gin and tonics. Have you tried a Manhattan? Oh, yeah, I really love Manhattans. Good whiskey is so hard to find. So you realize that these people that are having this kind of dialogue – once again, it's a pastime. Nobody's trying to get up on one another. Everybody's saying the same number of lines. People are giving each other's po positive strokes and interesting suggestions. But nobody's trying to win, so nobody's trying to be smarter than each other. They're just literally exchanging strokes, you know, idle bits of conversation, occasional compliments. So there's another pastime that people sometimes play, which in the book he refers to as flirts. So flirts is what it sounds like, only it's reciprocal. So Ted says, nice dress. Jenny, like it? I just bought it. Ted, you look great. Jenny responds, ah, I love your suit. Ted, Linda picked it out. Jenny, oh, it's always a pleasure to dress an attractive man. Now, can you see that in, a, in that 
dialogue between these two people, Jen and Ted and Jenny, all, they're literally just trading compliments, you know, and they're slightly suggestive or slightly sexual, but really it's just two people, two adults exchanging compliments with one another. Um, it's clear that Ted has a wife for bottom clothing, and Jen's like, you know, Jen's saying, well, lucky her, she's got a nice man to dress. That's always pleasant. The interesting thing about flirts is some people don't like it when their partners play it. <laughs> so that can get to be a little, that all of a sudden can take, if somebody overhears flirts and they're the kind of person that doesn't like those kinds of interactions between adults, that the, particularly when when they're the spouse or the the boyfriend or girlfriend of one of those people, it can get kind of dicey pretty quickly. So sometimes what starts out as a pastime or is a pastime between two people, when a third player joins in, becomes something that is not at all a pastime. It starts to become a game where someone's got to win and someone's got to lose. Now, so those are pastimes, which are formulaic interactions where people just sort of trade dialogue back and forth and everybody walks away reasonably happy. Another formulaic interaction are ceremonies and rituals. Now, these are kind of interesting. So ceremonies and rituals are formulaic interactions with rules, like real, like really serious, serious rules. So, And they include things like holiday dinners, weddings, funerals, award ceremonies, etc. Everybody in a ceremony or a ritual has a role, and those roles go with certain interactions, and those certain interactions have have strokes that go with them, and they have emotional value. So, for example, um, sitting at the head of a table at a holiday dinner, giving a daughter away at her wedding, kissing the bride, sitting with the bereaved at a funeral, receiving an award or giving an award, all of those things are roles. And if the person that has that assigned role doesn't behave the way that other parties in the, the ritual expect, Things get pretty ugly. It's a very important stroke economy. Like a, a wedding is a very important stroke moment. You know, the, a lot of power is given away in a wedding or a funeral. So when people feel like their roles have been violated, that they're not getting what they're due, they get really, really, really angry. And one of the reasons we have so many stories about bad weddings and bad funerals is a lot of times that's when you bring families together. And when families have different expectations or the rules are different in one family versus another, it can lead to some really toxic interactions because the the roles have been violated and the roles come with these huge strokes that you're supposed to get. And it's not like, you know, if somebody else gives your daughter away at the wedding, it's not like you can rerun the wedding. I mean, that's just been done. You're just never going to get those strokes that go with giving your daughter away at a wedding. The reason that this is important to be aware of is that if you're running a family or you're running a business, you're kind of the master of ceremonies for these rituals. You're the person in charge of these rituals. So you really have to be aware. Somebody's got to actually do the fitting to make sure that everybody knows what their role is and what they're going to get as part of that role. Like if you're giving, if, if at your company, if you give away awards, you know, and you give recognition to people at the end of the year for doing great work, you have to make sure that it's clear who's going to get those awards and what they get for those awards so that, you know, nobody feels bad because last year we got X and this year we got Y. And we are going to figure out what the correct response is to getting the reward. Like, do you get to talk for a couple of minutes or do you have to just sit down after you get handed your silver watch? Those kinds of things have to be handled by a master of ceremonies or what ends up happening is you have a lot of hurt feelings and those hurt feelings stay for a long time because there's no way to fix a broken once the ceremony's gone wrong or a ritual's gone wrong, it's almost impossible to fix because you can't get those strokes back. Now we're going to start talking about games. And one of the best things about the book Games People Play is this man, <laughs> Eric Byrne, and his associates, he actually worked with a number of people, documented a series of games. Games are patterns of behavior that give specific players a payoff. Adult players choose to play a game. So I might be playing a really mean game like let's pull a fast one on Eddie, which we'll talk about in a moment. But I might play, if I'm an adult, I can choose to play a really mean game with somebody else, a game where somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. The interesting thing is that in a lot of families, people play games and the children are forced to play. They cannot choose not to play. And if you've grown up in a household where people are playing games, these games that I'm about to talk about, things get the kids think this is normal, and they on they internalize these kinds of crazy. They they don't realize for a long time that they don't have to play. I mean, a lot of times they may not realize until they're 30 or 40 years old. So, 
if you're the person that a parent that's running a household and you see these games start, it's really important for you to be aware of the fact that you're teaching this kid, this person, that this is what real life is like. And he doesn't have a choice not to play. He's stuck living in that house. It's not you can leave. You know, if you don't like how your husband's treating you or your husband always plays being games, you can walk out. Or you, if your wife's treating you badly or if your parents, you're an adult person and your parents are treating you badly, you can leave. Children can't leave. So forcing children to play these kinds of games really is kind of cruel. Now, games have payoffs. When people play a game, sometimes the payoff is a positive feeling and sometimes it is a negative feeling. Sometimes people grew up in a stroke economy where, you know, it was the natural state of the stroke economy that you were supposed to feel bad all the time. And so these people tend to play games that make the make it so that people feel bad all the time. Like they're it's kind of like they're not they're never happy unless everybody's upset, if that makes sense. It's like that's what feels normal to them. So they keep manufacturing this, they keep playing these games that result in these strategies. And for them, there's an actual payoff, it's an actual benefit that they can play this game and people will feel this bad way. Now, so what's important about this is that if you're in a situation, like every time you go home and you visit, visit your parents, or every time you go home and you visit your spouse's parents, or every time you go to, to, to your office, you find yourself in this weird emotional state where you you're feeling bad it's like it just it's always like this always 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 you need to be aware that you're involved in a game somehow or other there's this game going on and you have to start looking around and trying to figure out what the hell the game is and you have to figure out who's getting paid off like who is setting up this game who's executing this game and who's happy with how it's coming out even if they're miserable if that makes sense who why does this keep happening you, because you'll usually there's always an engine that's making it happen and when you understand that the game who's do, running the game you can choose to not play the game right but you have to to some degree you have to see the game before you can choose not to participate now here's kind of the most important thing I'm about to say about games like if you remember just one thing about games this is probably the thing there are three levels of games a first degree game is socially acceptable you can play this first level game, first level of a game, in mixed company, and nobody tries to hide that they're playing it. It's a socially acceptable game. It might be a little screwed up, it might be a little bit mean, but, it, it, but nobody's trying to hide anything. The second level of a game, or second degree of a game, there's no permanent damage, but the players usually don't want anybody to know that they're playing this particular game. It's, a, it's kind of a secret game or a behind-closed-doors game. And then finally, there's a third-degree game. A third-degree game is one that, that is played for keeps, and somebody ends up dead or somebody ends up, <laughs> somebody ends up in surgery, somebody ends up in a courtroom, or somebody ends up at the morgue. And we'll talk about what, what those games look like. So let's talk, about <laughs> let's talk about the first game. So the first game is called If It Weren't For You. And it's often played by couples. And it usually starts with a line something like, if it weren't for you, I would. Player number one blames player number two for things that they couldn't do because the other player wouldn't let them. If it weren't for you, I could have finished college. If, if, if it weren't for you, I could have got a good job. If it weren't for you, I could have been really successful. Well, player two responds by reinforcing these things. So player two might say, well, that's right. You're my wife, so you're not allowed to work. Or, well, that's right. You couldn't finish college because we got pregnant and we had a baby. So player one says, if it weren't for you, I would have. And player two says, that's right. So how does this, what's the payoff? Because I said that every game has a payoff. Well, player one, the guy who says, if it weren't for you, I'd, gets to skip doing a whole bunch of things that they were afraid to do anyway. So, and they don't have to feel bad about it. If it weren't for you, I could have worked. Well, because now you're basically saying you didn't have to work or, or you don't have to work now because um, this person is stopping you. Player two, on the other hand, gets to feel very powerful. Both people get a payoff. Does it make sense? Now, how does this game end? How do you end this game if you don't want to play anymore? Well, one of two things can happen. Player one can say, can take responsibility. So he no longer says, if it weren't for you, I would. He just says, I haven't had a job up until now, but I want one now, so I'm going to go get one now. Right? So they just own up and say, I decide what's going to happen to me. Nobody's in charge of me. I make the decisions for myself. 
Or alternatively, player two says, you know what, you're free to do whatever you want to do. So, you know, when you say, if it weren't for you, I would, what do you want to do? Let's go do it. Whatever you want to do, you can go do. You're totally free to do whatever you want. So that's how you end the if it weren't for you game. So let's go ahead and look at another game. So this is a game which, I, if you have a teenager, you have played 4,000 billion times. It's called Yes, But. So this game is often played by parents and children, but it works for a lot of people. Player one says, expresses distress at not being able to do something. So they say, um, you know, I'd really like to go to college. And player two says, well, you can go to college. All you have to do is apply for financial aid. And then player one says, yes, but I don't know how to fill in the forms. Or yes, but I earn too much money. Or yes, but I'm not really good with numbers. And then player two says, well, let me help you. I can go ahead and help you work with the numbers. Or I can help you, you know. And then player one says, yes, but I really don't have time to be helped with the numbers right now. So the game just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The interesting thing is you can have about an infinite number of player twos. If you've had a teenage child that's making the transition from child to adult and they come up with a lot of yes buts, sometimes it's your parent. You, you know, you'll have both parents playing the yes but game, keep, you know, trying to help this kid move forward and the kid's throwing up roadblocks over and over and over again because they're scared. And ultimately that's something that's not about an outside force. It's It's them having to make the choice to solve the problem as opposed to having it solved for them. So this game ends when player one says, I think I'm just going to go get what I want. Or player two says, you know what? You're going to figure it out. If you need anything, let me know. <laughs> so player two just stops trying to solve the problem. So the game's over because player two doesn't play anymore. Or player one decides not to play anymore. Now, here's another game. It's called Schlemiel. So player one frequently comes to player two's home or office and screws something up, knocks coffee onto the carpet or persists on smoking and burns holes in the couch or whatever. And then player two gets angry. And then player one apologizes several hundred times. And player one might look like he's really mortified. Oh, I'm so sorry I spilled co um, coffee on your carpet. I know I do that all the time. I'm so sorry. And then shortly after being forgiven or given a pass, player one again does something that's damaging. So, you know, first they spilled coffee, then they spilled wine. They just keep screwing things up. And then player two gets mad again. And player two, player one apologizes. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So what are the payoffs here? Well, player one gets to do all this really mean stuff to player two. You know, I get to, not, I get to um, spill coffee. And I get to spill wine, and I get to get burn holes in the couch. And if I really don't like player two, that's pretty nice. Um, and in the end, player one keeps getting absolution over and over and over again, which means, you know, it's okay, don't worry about it, it's okay, don't worry about it. So whereas player two gets um, one to see player one, and two gets has permission to get angry over and over and over again and to say that player one is a schlemiel. So how does this game end? Well, one way it ends is by player one not going anywhere near player two and player two's house anymore. If player one recognizes that really the reason he keeps doing this stuff, whether it's unconscious or consciously, is because he doesn't like player two. That's a good reason not to go to player two's house anymore. Alternatively, player two can look at player one and say, I don't forgive you. So I want you to understand, I don't forgive you. So you're not getting a free pass on this. You're going to have to, I want you to clean this up. And if you, it's going to continue to happen, I'm, don't come over anymore. Because this, I can't believe this many mistakes is, is accidental. So one player calls the other player out, basically. So, and, and especially if player two says, you know, don't apologize. Because you're doing this over and over again, so I, I just don't believe that you're doing it accidentally. You know, it's basically, it's like saying your natural child wants to do this, and I don't want it to happen. So it's a dialogue. It's a pretty straightforward dialogue about, you know, multiple times you hurt me by accident. I have to believe sooner or later it's on purpose. So now let's talk about a more dangerous game. And this one's called Let's Play a Fast One on Joey. Now this is often played as a sexual game, but it can be played for money or other things as well. So player one, who is married, invites player two to have a, an affair. Player two agrees to the affair because you know, he wants to have he wants to have a relationship or a sexual affair with this with player one. Well, player one makes it so that player three finds out. Makes it so that so if it's a 
a wife who is engaging in a love affair with somebody at the office. She manufactures it so player three finds out that they're having an affair. Player two gets punished and abandoned. Player one and player three go back to being married. And in this, and so what are the payoffs for everybody? Well, player t- player one's payoff is that they feel desirable. They were having an affair. They were desired by two people. And then player three got so mad that it got, he got rid of the person that player one was having an affair with. Player three gets to feel powerful, right? And they get to feel like they got to have what player two wanted. And player two is left out in the cold, but originally they had the idea the payoff was going to be that they got a they got to have this illicit affair. So how does this game end? When any of the three parties stop playing, player one stops trying to have an affair. Player two says, you know, I'll have an affair with you if you're not married. Or player three says, you know what? If you're going to have affairs, that's fine with me. I don't care. You know, I'll I'll divorce you or you can have affairs. I don't care. So. But let's pull a fast one on Joey. It's a, a mean game, and it's one of those games that either ends up it, – unless it can be a game where people just get hurt, which is a level two game, or it can be a game that ends up with somebody in in a courtroom, somebody in the surgery, or somebody in the morgue. Now, another game that's a very, very famous game, and this one people play all the time, so next time you see it being played, you'll know the name of it. It's called the Carp Men Triangle. Now, this game requires three players. Usually, it's two parents and a kid, but it works with any three players, really. So, player one, as a critical parent, tells player two what to do. Player two, responding as a rebellious child, rejects the command. Player three steps in to rescue player two, and that turns player one into a victim. So, let's give an example. So, I walk in, I see my teenage daughter, and I say, you know what? Clean up your room. It's like 400,000 times I've asked you to clean up your room and you never clean up your room. I really hate that. You're such a, you know, you're such a, a rotten child because you never clean up your room. Her dad hears me yelling and then he'll come in and he'll say, "Hey, don't you shout at my don't don't shout at your daughter. That's a terrible way to talk to her. You shouldn't talk to her like that." And then the daughter who loves her mother steps up and says, "Hey, don't talk to my mom like that." And then I tell her as the mother, hey, don't talk to your dad like that. So can you see what's happening is everybody's taking a turn at being the attacker, and everybody's taking a turn at being the victim, and everybody's taking a turn at being the rescuer. So whenever you see a cycle where it's a, there's a persecutor, a rescuer, and a victim, and then somebody who becomes the um, – whenever you see that kind of rotating persecutor, rescuer, victim cycle happen, that's a Cartman Triangle. Now, what are the payoffs? Well, oddly enough, everybody feels like they get attention, right? So this is the kind of game you often play at the end of a very long day when everybody's feeling, you know, really low and has a lot of bad energy going on and they're very frustrated. It's basically a big excuse to have a row, and then after the row, you can a lot of times sort of make peace with one another. In a more functional family, you will, and other ones, you'll, everybody will just end up walking away being really angry and they'll play it again tomorrow. Ending the game requires one of the players not to play. So that would mean if I shout at my daughter, my husband doesn't step in. He just stands outside. And if he doesn't like how how I'm treating the child, then he can he can call me out of the room and say, "Can I talk to you for a minute?" But when he when we have a dialogue, it's separate from the child that might try to defend either of us. To prevent a Cartman triangle, what you do is you ensure that there's only ever two people talking. So there's no chance for anybody to be rescued. A Cartman Triangle is like one of the most common games played in almost every family. In fact, whenever you see three people fighting, it's almost always a Cartman Triangle. So those are a few of the games that, and and in the book, uh, games people play, there are dozens. And so one of the reasons to get the book is so you can get a list of all of the games that are played. And if you're a writer or a screenwriter or a playwright, you will find and <laughs> you want to make sure that you can really turn up the drama and realistically in any piece of um fiction the game you know looking at the games people play you'll be shocked at like how many of them make ac- excellent stories i mean there's times we just look at the titles of the games and think we should just call i'm just going to write a movie and it's going to be called let's pull a fast one on joey this is a great name for a movie but there's a lot of great um games that are that you may find uh 
if you read the book, which I recommend that you do. It's, I think it's only like a 7 or $8 book. Now, I want to talk about the fact that there are good games. A good game is one in which all the players win, and sometimes people have hu- hu- hidden agendas and strange payoffs, but when all, all is said and done, everybody kind of goes home happy. And the interesting thing about good games is that they can keep people really amused and entertained for years. A lot of people will start playing a good game, and they really just end up playing it for the rest of their lives because it's so much fun. So one good game is called The Busman's Holiday. So in A Busman's Holiday, someone takes a vacation from doing what they do by going somewhere else to do it or doing it for another reason. For example, you know, I may be a waiter that works in a restaurant in London, and it might work for a really posh restaurant, or it might be like a maitre d' or something like that, working in a really posh restaurant. And when I take a vacation, what I might decide to do is go to where people are really poor, and instead of setting up a kitchen for the richest people in the world, I start setting up a kitchen for the poorest people in the world. And it may be the case that I don't tell anybody what I do. I don't tell them where I work. I just appear to work miracles, and I don't talk about how I got this particular skill or where how I was able to get this particular resource. The, the payoff for the people that I'm serving is they get something better than they, ever, they could have ever expected. Some people that commonly play the busman's holiday are secret philanthropists. And a lot of times, you know, you'll, you'll have people who are people that work high up at corporations will kind of put on their, you know, play clothes and fly to far off places and work for philanthrop- philanthropic organizations. Um, and they'll just use their massive resources to have things magically happen without taking credit for them. Another interesting game is called Cavalier. And this game can be played by people of either gender. And basically, within the bounds acceptable to society, player one takes every opportunity to make somebody else feel really, really good about themselves. They may compliment that person on their appearance or their skill or their achievement. They may find ways to be helpful or useful to them. Uh, They may find ways to make the road easier for them or to help them achieve their objectives. But they carefully control their behavior so that the person really blossoms under that attention. And the feeling that the cavalier gets, the player one gets, is the fact that they feel very powerful. They know that they played a really key role in making this person much, much more successful. And they did it without harming them in any way. So the result is that in a year or two or three, when the person that they sort of groomed and made more successful and stronger is off on their own and doing great things and wonderful things, the player one can say, that happened because I made it happen. And sometimes they call this relationship a mentor relationship, although the problem with using the word mentor is that a lot of times in today's modern parlance, a mentor relationship is supposed to be somewhat reciprocal. A cavalier relationship, it's not about reciprocity. Player two, the person that you're you're grooming or making more successful, never has to pay you back. Whereas in a mentor relationship, sometimes people think that if I'm your mentor, then in years to come, you have to help me when I'm down and out or if I call, ask you for a favor, and that's not a cavalier. In a way, cavalier is kind of like gardening. It's basically looking at people as human plants and trying to see what's going to make them grow. The last game is one called They'll Be Glad They Knew Me. This one, <laughs> this one is a little bit on the, uh, little bit on the mean side. And it's not super mean, but it's a little. It's what to do with if you have negative feelings um, from an experience, you can have. You can play the. You'll, they'll be glad they knew me game. Uh, it's a variant of I'll show of a game called I'll show them. So a player decides to become very successful and very gracious, so that everyone he meets is really glad they know him, and he strives to be exactly the kind of pe- person that everybody really wishes they were. The reason it's a a variant of I'll show them is he shames people who were unkind to them in the past by being overkind to them. So, in effect, he's demonstrating that whatever they did to him mattered so little to him, he didn't even notice it. And to play this game, player one simply has to allow himself to feel happy and be successful and to feel success every time he does, he, he has an achievement. And then he has to say something nice about the people who were not nice to him in the past. So, for example... Let's say I was a uh, an artist working at a company for at an advertising agency, and I worked at the advertising agency for 10 years, and I worked really, really hard, and I did a lot of really amazing work, but I never really got any kind of recognition. 
So that goes on for 10 years, and I'm feeling pretty bitter and pretty angry, and I just quit. And, and I end up, you know, I'm sort of scarred by the whole situation, and I end up getting getting my own job. Well, if I'm playing, they'll be glad they knew me. What I do is I, I, I start getting my own jobs, and I start building my own company, and I start becoming more successful. And every single time I have to talk about that company I work for, I say that I was real, I felt really fortunate that I got to work there because I really got to master a lot of skills. And they, I really learned a huge amount by working there. And it was really excellent that I got to work there all those years. And it was really good that they let me go. Because if they hadn't let me go, I mean, they must have, maybe they saw something in me I didn't see in myself. But because they let me go, I actually started my own business. And I've been really successful since then. And I really can't thank them enough, you know, for letting me work with them and letting me participate in doing some really great work and then letting me go so I can have my own business. And I mean, we're competitors now, but I still really like them. So you can see that They'll Be Glad They Knew Me has this edge of getting even, but it also has the edge of being allowing yourself to be extremely happy and extremely successful and even being thankful to the people who let you go or who who, who didn't give you what you wanted so you could go on and get it for yourself. One of the last key concepts to understand is one called the script. And it's a very powerful thing. And a lot of times people have scripts that they internalized in childhood that it takes them literally 30 or 40 years to, to pull themselves out of. And knowing that scripts exist can make it so that you can end them more, more quickly and more smoothly. So scripts come from the fact that children watch their parents as they grow up and they see the challenges that their parents face, and they really identify very strongly with their parents. So they frequently adopt the stories that their parents have and the stories that their parents are telling themselves when bad things are happening. They adopt the stories, the challenges, and the conflicts that their parents had, and they sort of adopt them as their own. And they, they for example, they may decide that if their parents had a particular conflict – in their marriage. A lot of times people, children will have acquire the script that they have to have that same relationship. So if mother was always saying about father, you know, he's really dominating and he's really controlling and he really treats me like shit, but I have to stay in the house because, you know, I need to take care of the kids and I just have to stay no matter what. Um, a lot of times young girls, when they first have a relationship, will end up end up acquiring somebody very similar to the parent that was difficult. And or that the mother thought was difficult, and then they will use almost exactly the same rela- same words to describe their relationship. Well, he's really a jerk, but you know, I, I have to. I'm stuck with him, so I have to keep him. And this is like, you know, they'll be saying these kinds of words when they're 15 or 16 or 22 or 24 when they're really not true. But the thing is that those words that they've internalized from their parents are coming out of their mouth because they, honest to God, see things in the same black and white way that their their parents saw them. They've internalized those, that dialogue. And they will continue to play out that script because they'll try – in effect, their unconscious mind is really trying to solve the problem that their parents had. And it may, they may eventually come up to the same solution that their mother had at about the same time their mother had that solution. Like maybe it will result, result in a divorce or maybe it will result in going to see marriage and family counselors. But the point is the only reason that they had that stupid script, the only reason that they had this – they went on the stupid safari in the first place is because they internalized the script that they got from their parent. So scripts can be really toxic and they can make people gravitate toward really abusive relationships over and over and over again. And they can cause real financial hardship over time. They can make it so that people, you know, if your parents always struggled with money and, you know, they, one or both of them could never really work or always really struggled with um, being able to hold down a job or, or struggled with, um, addiction or abuse or all kinds of other things, those kinds of struggles, you can inherit them and actually end up playing out those same kinds of relationships yourself. And you think to, you literally may think to yourself, well, you know, my father died a drunk and I certainly can't give up. If my dad couldn't give up drinking, I certainly can't give up drinking, you know. Or my father died young, so that means I'm going to die young. I really can't look forward to the future, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to, worry about trying to look forward for the future because I already know that I'm not I'm going to die young like my father because I'm like my my dad. So um 
bad scripts and dangerous games kind of end up working together. A lot of times people have scripts that lead them into dangerous games. And transactional analysis would say that if you keep finding yourself in the same situation over and over and over and over again, you've got some sort of script running and you probably need to figure out where you got it and how to get rid of it. Because something about you, some part of your subconscious is making you repeat that pattern of behavior. You're trying to resolve a conflict that happened to somebody else a long time ago. And the only way that you can fix that problem is by addressing it directly. I think one of the things I mentioned at the first part of this call is the fact that a lot of times transactional analysis is used the time that <laughs> that I used it and the time that I've seen it used. Um, and when it was first created, one of the reasons that uh, it was adopted by a lot of people that were working to make workplaces and um, more efficient was you can use transactional analysis to make really productive um, work in, work environments and pretty pleasant home environments. The first, and they would, generally speaking, your objective is to recognize and be conscious of the stroke economy that's that's in operation in your home and in your workplace, and to realize that every single person in at work and at home needs strokes every single day, and that warm fuzzies are the best way to get giving people warm fuzzies for what they do right works about four thousand times better than giving them cold pricklies or any of those other things when they do something wrong. So reinforcing positive behavior works about 4,000 times better than reinforcing, um, than saying anything about negative behavior. The other thing is um, staying in the adult when you communicate to people, realizing you are you really cannot make people do anything and no one can make you do anything. You can all, you know, some if you're in a situation where people are trying to make you do something, You're an adult, you're allowed to leave. You just go. (laughs) It's like, turns out, I don't have to do anything you tell me to do because you can't force me to do anything. You can't berate me, you can't yell at me, you should not. You can tell me why I should, you know, you can tell me why you think I should do something, but you can't actually make me do anything. So realizing as an, and maintaining sort of this adult headspace when you're interacting with other people is important. And communicating to people in an adult voice instead of using the critical parent voice or the nurturing parent voice which, or the rebellious child or the compliant child voice. It's staying in the adult. Two plus two is four. If X, then Y. If I do this, then Y will happen. You know, If you don't put the garbage out at Friday morning, we're going to be stuck with it the whole next week. You know? <laughs> So it's just stating facts is going to work a lot better for most people than trying to use shoulds and oughts and trying to force people to do things or make people feel bad to do things. Um, be, it's giving expression to your natural child where you speak very clearly in terms of I feel this, I want this, I like this, I don't like that. Speaking honestly about how you feel without making people responsible for how you feel is also a very powerful thing. It's more powerful if you look at your kid and you say, I worry about you when you don't do your homework. That's more likely to be successful than saying your life is going to be totally ruined if you don't do your homework or you have to do your homework or I won't like you. You'll get, you'll get farther by stating how you feel than you will trying to force people to do something. Finally, realizing that, every, that people do play a lot of games and when you start to see patterns of behavior, behavior that look really non-functional and really abusive. Realize that there's a payoff in there someplace. There's some. There's some like like why would anybody play? Let's pull a fast one on Joey. It's because there's a payoff there. For, for basically for all of the players. If if playing this game where I I say yes I'll have an affair with you and yet you know my husband walks in on us. And doing that multiple times, that's a game. I'm getting a payoff, my husband's getting a payoff, and presumably the guy, you know, the guys we keep tricking into the stupid relation th- relationship are getting a payoff. And for that game to end, one of the players has to stop playing. And then finally, realizing that some play, people play really, really toxic, toxic and dangerous games, and re- realizing that you can't, like, sometimes the only way to, to handle that game is to step back. Right. If somebody wants to play, let's play a fast one on Joey. Uh, Joey, they keep doing it over and over and over again. Like, let's say you keep ending up being player three, walking in on your your spouse having an affair. Sometimes the only solution to that is not to play, and to say, okay, here's the thing. I don't want to have this kind of relationship anymore. I'm not getting any payoff. 
from it anymore. So I'm not going to do it anymore, which means we're not going to be married anymore. Because I just don't, I'm not enjoying this game. I don't want to play. So, and sometimes people play those kinds of games and it, they get pretty abusive. So you really have to decide to end them by ending the relationship or stepping, getting away from the person that re- refuses to stop playing. So, I've, having gone through all of these things, and this is a pretty straightforward introduction to games people play, you can get the book on Amazon. It's called Games People Play. It's really short. I think it's like six or seven bucks. And if you read it, <laughs> you... If you're if if you're anybody creative that has to write about human relationships, you'll find a whole bunch of ideas in there that you'll find very interesting. And you, if you want to have, if you have a story and it's not quite long enough, and you need to have a B plot and a C plot, <laughs> Games People Play is a great place to get them. Um, it does pull no punches, and it's written by a practicing psychiatrist who's seen a lot of terrible things, and it does describe some very terrible games. And the only reason I mention that is. If you're expecting a light reading, like a lot of times when you read a self-help book, it's kind of light reading. This is not a light reading book. This is, it's very, it's very thin, but it's very serious. Everybody who reads this book will see themselves and their families in it. That's just normal because he was a practicing therapist and he did family therapy. So you will see, you you will see your family in it, um, and you'll see patterns of behavior described that you've actually lived through. And so you may find reading it interesting just because you'll realize, my God, we're not the only ones who played that game. I thought we were the only ones. But no, many people have played, you know, Let's Pull a Fast One on Joey or Hartman Triangle, Cartman Triangle. Now, one thing I mentioned at the beginning, and I'm going to reiterate here, transactional analysis does work pretty well to rearrange human relationships. And it is it can be really transformative very, very, very swiftly. When When I was a youngster and my mother had gotten into transactional analysis and we were, it's hard to explain, but my mother was in transactional analysis. I don't even think I needed nearly as much therapy, therapy as I got. I mean, <laughs> but there were other kids that were in, that need, they needed to be able to form groups because group therapy is one of the things they do in transactional analysis and they needed another person. So I, w- I would end up in these, you know, hanging out with doing transactional analysis. And I did actually see it transform whole families really quickly to really, you know, people who had been, you know, pe- people who had been committing suicide, you know, and all of a sudden the whole, the whole family relationship changed. The whole dynamic became a lot less um, broken and dysfunctional. So it can be very, very transformative very, very quickly. But the problem is because it is very transformative. If you have a, if you have somebody in the family or somebody in the relationships that's really playing some heavy-duty, ugly games and really can't live without them, like they're a malignant narcissist or something. So they really kind of, it, 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 they're not really firing on all cylinders. Things can get pretty dodgy when you change the game. So before you start practicing what you read in this book, if you have something serious, serious going on in your family, you, honest to God, do have to go see a real live working therapist and you have to talk to them about the changes, that you, the behavior that you're seeing and the changes that you want to make and to really think through the changes that you're going to make because this can, honest to God, be like setting off dynamite. I mean, some people don't like it when you say, I'm not going to play this game anymore, you know. <laughs> it's like they just don't like it and they get really violent. So, you know, if somebody's play, been playing, really likes the game, let's play a fast one on Joey, and you say, you know what? I don't want to play this game anymore. I'm leaving you. The person that you're leaving, if they're really sick in the head, may say, no, you're not. And if you try to leave me, I'm going to kill you. So you don't want to get into that whole kind of dialogue until you know. You need to really just think things out before you make big decisions based upon this book. And the reason I mention it is because it is real, the stuff it talks about, the behaviors it talks about ending, um, you can end them, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to end up having trouble on the backside. So just you, it's it's like doing surgery. This book talks about ways to do surgery. One should not get out one's scalpel and start carving up one's life, you know. So that sort of covers all of the topics that um, the, in this little primer on transactional analysis. A lot of the protocols that are in transactional analysis have actually been used by, um, have been incorporated into tradi- into a lot of family therapies all over, like the fact that, you know, people are autonomous and they have a right not to be made to do things, right? Like, you know, if you if you right now were to take your kid in, to a therapist most of the time and the, the kid was, 
almost it, it, all kinds of different ages, but specifically, you know, like a teenager, and and you were saying, well, you know, I have to, you know, I have to force them to do their homework every day. They never do their homework, and I have to force them to do it. The therapist would say, stop it. It's not your homework. You can't force them to do anything. You can tell them that you think it's important for them to do it. You can give them incentives if they do do it, but you can't force people to do things. It's not it's not appropriate. You can't. We don't live in a slave society, so you can't force people above a certain age to do things. And teenagers are they're definitely in that zone. And the more you try to force them to do things, the worse things are going to get. So a lot of the principles of transactional analysis have actually been filtered out into standard cognitive behavioral therapy these days. But if you want somebody who specifically uses the language and the modalities of transactional analysis, you can find people. You can find people just by looking them up on on Google. And once again, I want to thank you very much for coming on to the call. If you have any questions after the event, feel free to email me. I really very much look forward to hearing from you.